You know, at first glance, most of us would have a hard time seeing a connection between the line we stand in here at the bank and the way a major entertainment company operates its business. Or how about between the operations of a nationwide freight company and breast cancer research, or even protecting our national interests around the world? Or how about forecasting the outcome of a presidential election and searching for sunken treasure off the coast of South Carolina? Well, the fact is, they're all connected by science, not just any science, but one that combines several familiar disciplines to produce some unique formulas that help us make decisions here in the real world. Its name, operations research, or as it's often called, management science. Hi, I'm Jackson Bain. If you're like me, you haven't given a lot of thought to how management science affects your daily life. But in fact, it does in a big way. Let's take a look around your community. Operations research plays a role in a range of basic services you depend on every day, from police dispatching and the design of the local transit system, the food you buy at the grocery, the books at the bookstore, or, or the videos you rent. All of these owe something to operations research and the management sciences. If you go anywhere by car or bus, it can help you get there quickly by determining the best routes to travel. And if you've ever flown in an airplane, well, operations research is there in a big way. Just ask Dr. Carla Hoffman of George Mason University. Hi, Jackson. Hello, Carla. One of Dr. Hoffman's areas of expertise happens to be the role operations research plays in aeronautics. That's true. You'd be surprised how critical it is in determining your check-in time at the airport, plus a host of other things, like the type of aircraft you fly in, the crew selected to fly it, when you take off, when you land, which gate you arrive at, and of course, how quickly you get your luggage. That's important. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. By now, you're probably getting the idea. Operations research or management science, let's call it ORMS for short, has to do with using mathematics, economics, computer science, engineering, and even some psychology to help people make decisions and solve problems. But as little as 75 years ago, if you would have mentioned something called operations research, nobody would have had a clue what you were talking about. In the early 1900s, the American engineer Frederick Taylor used time studies to analyze and evaluate worker performance. He was convinced that he could discover the best way to accomplish any given task. About the same time, Henry Gantt went about developing a scientific scheduling system for loading jobs on machines and minimizing production delays. Then in 1915, Ford Harris of the Westinghouse Corporation published a model formula for inventory control. And you know what? That is still in use today. Meanwhile, a mathematician named A.K. Erlang, who worked for the Danish telephone company, began what people might have thought was some pretty esoteric research. In doing so, he founded a branch of applied mathematics that affects us right here in this line. Erlang's contribution was his innovative use of mathematics to analyze the waiting times of callers in automatic instead of manual telephone exchanges. Well, today, his work is associated with what's called queuing theory. And when you look at it, Queuing theory is pretty relevant in our lives. Just think about how often you stand in line or are kept waiting for anything on any given day. The reason you wait essentially has to do with the lack of resources. In this case, not enough service people to handle customer demand. As a result, the waiting line. Now, despite what we might think, there are some people who care a great deal about waiting lines. These are people whose business involves serving the public in one way or another, and whose bottom line is absolutely affected by the number of customers choosing to remain in the line or choosing to leave it. Well, it comes down to balancing the customer's inconvenience with the costs of providing a service. Now, the most important part of successful queuing is to keep people moving. Sometimes it helps to look at what kind of queue people form. 
Some are single stream queues, like the first come, first serve lines we see at a bank or the post office. Others are the multiple stream queues we see at the grocery store, which allow customers to choose their own checkout line. And now the question becomes what kind or how many queues are necessary to provide a satisfactory level of customer service? In fact, one of the nation's most successful companies believes it is vital to its business to get the answer to this question. How long is the average visitor willing to wait in line for a ride? Yes, that's right. Disneyland employees spend a lot of time collecting customer opinions on site and then reviewing data of their experiences. One of the interesting things we've studied and we've found to be pretty, pretty common is that once a line reaches 90 minutes, there's a reject factor. Everyone remembers more or less the cattle pen that started this all where, ooh, we've got all these people waiting in line, so you orderly put them back and forth in a series of ropes, but uh, that becomes very uh, taxing if you do that more than, say, two or three times in a day. So uh, I think the exciting thing here at Disneyland now is we offer a multitude of really interesting environmental experiences. You are in a jungle right here. <laughs> These answers are so important to the organization that it incorporates queuing theory into its overall design plans. Then, they develop computer programs that simulate visitor behavior and waiting times. Well, I think when queues first started, it was just because there were too many people waiting to get in and not enough capacity to handle all the people that demanded to see the show. And as a result of that, the longer the queue lines grew, I think the more I know in our case, we realized that our duty really was to entertain them while they're waiting to get in. So a whole new business spawned from the, the natural growth of queue lines. They just happened, but then around that, we created an industry that makes them a part of the entertainment. And I think that time that you spend, it's roughly 30 minutes where we've got show here for you in the line, is really important to setting the mood and making the adventure that much more exciting for you when you do get to the ride itself. As you could probably imagine, there are a lot of reasons why businesses would want to shorten their customers' waiting time. And it gives us some understanding why operations research and management science would be considered a decision science. But queuing theory isn't all there is to ORMS. And while you might think that it's primarily concerned with decisions that have financial consequences like revenues and costs, profits, that isn't the whole story. Some think ORMS's most important contribution had little to do with dollars and cents. They claim it had a definite effect on world affairs. In fact, helping decide the outcome of the Second World War. It began in the late 30s when the British military set up a team of specialists from various scientific fields to investigate the most effective use of radar. This was, in fact, the beginning of operations research. Well, the success of the British project was so dramatic that during the war, the military assembled more teams to study problems having to do with anti-submarine warfare, civilian defense, and deploying war vessels to accompany supply ships. Two examples of this team approach are credited with helping win the Battle of Britain and ultimately the Battle of the North Atlantic, thus helping turn the tide of the entire war. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. The American allies saw the value of this team approach and soon its military included what were called operations analysis groups. They were comprised of mathematicians, statisticians, physicists, and others. After the war, ORMS became recognized as a scientific discipline, and it began to find its way into scores of businesses, nonprofit, and government organizations. 
But with the eventual arrival of computers, ORMS really took hold. Soon there dawned a whole new era in business. This is UNIVAC, tomorrow's miracle of electronics here today. In government, industry, science, and in the defense of our nation. Well, as you've probably guessed by now, ORMS has its roots in mathematics. Mathematics designed to help people make decisions in the real world. The key is to have an approach that works in an environment that's often changing. And since it's often impractical or expensive to test a proposed solution in an actual situation, you need something that represents the essence of the problem. You need, in other words, an efficient and reliable model. Now, there are many types of ORMS applications in the business world. For example, retail companies use it to assign territories to its salespeople to determine the number of accounts they'll serve and establish travel routes to minimize the distances they cover. Now, in each of these instances, the point is to find ways to increase productivity while minimizing the costs. The end result, of course, being maximizing profits. Another common application is one having to do with resource distribution. Well, this was the logistical problem the Yellow Freight Delivery Company faced in finding the best way to manage its freight routing. It's a problem many transportation and shipping companies have in a business where things are constantly on the move. Key decision makers, in this case Yellow Freight's terminal managers, lacked the information they needed to coordinate the activities of trucks, drivers, and terminals around the network. The result led to inefficiencies that severely affected their business. Now, Yellow Freight's goal was to balance the many variables that affect the efficient operation of their system and then ultimately lower their costs. So the company asked Princeton professor Warren Powell to study the problem. We found the problem was hopelessly large. The breakthrough was realizing that the mathematics of dynamic programming Dynamic programming is the programming of activities over time, which is the word dynamic. The mathematics of dynamic programming allowed us to take the problem and break it down into smaller problems in individual time slices. Well, Professor Powell came up with a model which replicated the way the Yellow Freight Network really operated and the way decisions had been made by getting high-powered computers to do what people in the field had been doing. The result? was an interactive core planning system program called SysMol. SysMol is the core planning system at Yellow Freight that allows them to see problems as they're happening, uh, as, uh, plan the flows of drivers, manage the empties, prioritize the loads, anticipate problems before they can happen. For Yellow Freight, operations research allows it to take advantage of the information it has in a competitive business environment and use it with a higher level of precision and efficiency. But that's not all. Powell soon realized that Yellow Freight's problem was not unique. He found that, whether it's automobiles, aircraft, products, or employees, this tool allows you to look into the future, anticipate needs, and then make the best decisions. Helping companies run efficiently has its rewards, but OR is not all business. There's also a little bit of treasure hunting involved, too. Actually, the story begins in 1857 with a ship called the Central America. When people wanted to come from, from California back to, to New York City, uh, you didn't go across the country. There was no transcontinental railroad. So uh, if you had the money, uh, you would take a, a steamship from San Francisco down to the west coast of Panama, and there was a nice train that would meet you, and that would take you across uh, uh, Panama to the east coast, and waiting for you on the east coast would be another U.S. mail steamer, in this case the, the SS Central America. Now in those days, uh, they didn't have an, a weather service, they didn't have tele telegraph, uh, at least uh, to the ship, so they didn't know that they were steaming into a hurricane. When they started to meet the rough weather,